Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So in the past I've made a few videos about the famous, um, legendary, some would say, 1796 pattern light cavalry sabre, the British 1796 pattern. And uh, here is one. This is an example that's just been sold actually. It's just about to be shipped off to its new customer. Obviously I, I buy and sell um, antique swords, uh, part of my own collection through Eastern Antique Arms, the links below for anybody who doesn't know. And um, this is a really nice example, it's uh, quite patinated so it's quite dark that means, but it's made by Osborne and it's very very clean overall, it's just you know it's got no real damage to it, it's still got the leather of the grip, it's just a really good representative example. Now Osborne was one of the people who was really pivotal in designing this model of sabre. John Gaspard Le Marchand, who was essentially a cavalry commander who died during the Peninsula War fighting for the British, um, gets most of the credit for designing this, um, this sword, this model of sword, and possibly and probably based on his experience in the Austrian army um, fighting the French. But in actual fact Osborne probably played, Osborne was a sword maker, probably played a fairly pivotal part in designing it as well. It is definitely inspired by Central and Eastern European earlier sabre types. And I've talked about in the past how the shape of the blade, um, and I'll talk a little bit more specifically about it in a second, but the shape of the blade isn't very conducive for thrusting. Now, I am aware that some people have made videos, uh, particularly Cold Steel, uh, Lynn, Lynn Thompson is famous for doing this and showing that uh, you can stab into a carcass with a 1796 pattern like cavalry saber. Well, yes, indeed, of course, any sharp piece of metal, be it a nail or the back end of a hammer, can go into a uh, lump of meat. However, when we say that this blade is not very conducive for thrusting, it's due to a number of factors. The two main ones are the curvature of the blade, meaning that in most fencing situations it's difficult to get the point online to thrust. Um, the next point is because of the curvature of the blade, and if you therefore the way that you have to compensate to put the point in means you lose a lot of your reach. If you lose a lot of your reach, in a real situation fighting a real opponent, you're very rarely going to be able to actually get the point in. Um, and lastly is the shape of the point itself. The shape of the point is very clearly not designed with thrusting in mind, it's designed with cutting in mind. Much like a Japanese katana, this type of so-called hatchet point means that you can cut really 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 effectively right up close to the tip which you can't do with pointier types of sword like this um, because they're just simply they don't have the right edge geometry and, and um, cross-sectional shape uh, to be able to cut well at the tip however this type of sword can cut well at the tip but what you sacrifice is the ability to thrust well at the tip um, the asymmetrical point that is that the point is in line with the back edge of the blade is generally a bad design if you're thinking about a thrusting sword but if you think about swords that are famous for cutting it's very common for the back for the point to be in alignment with the back of the blade. Um, so it's a kind of, you know, you gain in one, one area and you lose in another. However, what I really want to talk about very briefly is not this sword made by Osborne, I'll remind you. Um, it's a version that was brought out in very small numbers and made for officer's swords. It was never a regulation cavalry trooper's sword like this is. So this is the type of sword that was bought by the government and issued to troops. This is an officer's sword that was made to address the fact that this blade was recognised at not being very good at thrusting. And it was Osborne, in conjunction with Gunby, the so-called Osborne and Gunby company, uh, came up with this. And there we go. So it is the thrust friendly version of the 1796 light cavalry saber and this is an extremely rare sword. This in fact is the first one I have ever held, let alone owned, um, and I have sold it to a friend of mine because um, <clears throat> it doesn't really fit in my collection and some people on my channel sometimes go, Matt that's an amazing sword, why are you selling it? Quite simply, I can't keep all of the swords. I really wish I could. And if I ever win the lottery, then indeed I might keep all the swords that I buy. However, unfortunately, if I want to keep buying swords, I have to sell swords. So I'll just plug again Eastern Antique Arms, link below. Uh, that's why I sell swords. It's so that I can buy other swords. And I've had to narrow down my interest to a very specific few things. 
because um, you can't collect everything and so therefore I focus on those things and this doesn't really fit in my collection but it is an amazing sword um, and really really super rare so what are the things that are different about it well first of all let's just say the hilt is the same as pretty much most officers uh, light cavalry, 1796 light cavalry swords, okay? There's nothing special about the hilt whatsoever, okay? Completely standard. The blade, however, is very clearly completely different. Now, you can see it has a different cross section. It has two fillers, in fact, a main filler and then a secondary filler. This adds to stiffness, okay? Um, generally speaking, it means the blade is still as light as having one great big filler, like we see on the 1796, just one filler there. Um, but by having two, it makes it a little bit more rigid in the thrust. Secondly, of course, it's straighter. It's not as curved. So do we give up cutting capacity to some degree? Uh, maybe. Um, the, the, the power of a cut is not always down to the curvature of a sword. Um, a curved edge, as I've talked about in previous videos, has certain benefits to it. So we are giving up some of those benefits by having a straighter blade. But a straighter blade exerts more force in the thrust and more importantly, it's easier to get the point online in most situations. Whether you're charging on horseback or whether you're actually fencing on foot and aiming to, for example, parry riposte. If you parry riposte with a curved blade, your, your blade's usually pointing in the wrong direction. Parry and cut thrust with a straight blade, it's pointing in the right direction. So this is more useful, shall we say, for thrusting. Um, and of course that point, it has essentially a clipped back point like a bowie knife or in fact like a falchion or a messer. So this isn't a new type of blade actually. What Osborne and Gumby did is they went, okay, we need to be able to do X, Y and Z, so the blade needs to look like this. And what did they do? They reinvented, perhaps intentionally or unintentionally, I don't know, they reinvented a Mesa or a falchion blade. And it came out really, really well. And do you know what I have often said? I don't know why this sword wasn't more popular than it was. Um, if this had become the regulation cavalry sword, I suspect that lots of people all over Europe would have copied it as incidentally Germany and various other countries did call Prussia at the time and the various German states did in fact copy the 1796 like cavalry and the so-called 1811 Blucher uh, model and that sort of stayed in use throughout the 19th century but I suspect this would have been hugely popular if it had been made in greater numbers and become wider known it's incredibly rare today this one is not in the best condition as you can see it's black it's pitted um, it's it's um, lost its leather covering from its grip, it's just got the wood there now, so it's not in great condition. However, it is extremely rare. If you want to look at more pictures of this, incidentally, look on Eastern Antique Arms where you can see some uh, photos of this sword. Um, but it really is an amazing design and we know that it was a popular and successful design in the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries. Um, and you could even argue that, you know, in other countries continued to use this clip back point on their um, sort of hussar sabres in, in later centuries, 17th, 18th centuries. So really I think it's amazing that it wasn't more popular and made in greater numbers, but it is extremely rare today. And when you do find ones in good condition, you're looking at thousands of pounds if you want to get one in good condition starting, think £2,000 upwards, okay? There's no kind of upper limit, because obviously if one was owned by a famous person that would stick the um, the value way, you know, really high. But uh, usually you're looking at two, three, four, five thousand pounds this kind of amount of money. Um, this much, much cheaper, much more affordable, because of course it doesn't have the condition of, of the really good, um, well-preserved ones. But nevertheless, an amazing sword has been sharpened and it still remains fairly sharp. Um, so probably saw use somewhere, maybe, who knows, Battle of Waterloo kind of period. So it would have been late Napoleonic Wars we're looking at, 1810 to 1815. The Osborne and Gunby um, adaptation or specialised non-regulation version of the 1796 light cavalry officer's sword. An amazing thing. Cheers folks. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, follow us on Facebook, you can buy t-shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.